Welcome everyone to our afternoon panel. Thanks for joining us for aid, conflict transformation and peace building in the region. I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the unceded lands on which we meet, the Ngunnawal people, and pay our respect to their elders past, present and families. My name's Tanya Maletic and I'm a Senior Research Fellow at the Initiative for Peace Building at the University of Melbourne. And I work on our uh, multidisciplinary research, teaching and policy development towards uh, better engagement in conflict prevention and peace building in Australia and our region with partners. I've been working uh, on a range of peace building initiatives in Australia, Southeast Asia and China for the past two decades. And I'm thrilled to be moderating this session because it brings together uh, very experienced and uh, uh, and diverse peace builders from that are Australia based but working in the region, and we'll have a chance today to uh, hear from our panel, who I'll introduce in just a moment, um, who are doing some work, uh, and it will speak to us on what are very uh, complex um, and diverse conflicts in our region and how they're with a, a little bit of insight into some of the work that they're doing to address some of the drivers of, of conflict um, and build greater peace and justice. So welcome everyone uh, over to my right. I'd like to introduce uh, Kieran O'Toole. Kieran works, some of you may know Kieran, Kieran works with Conciliation Resources, an international peace building organisation committed to preventing and responding to violent conflict. Kieran heads up the Australian arm of the organisation Conciliation Resources Australia based in Melbourne and focuses on CR's Pacific and Southeast Asia programs. Kieran commenced working with CR in Fiji in 2010, where his work included supporting the development of community and national level dialogue processes and heading the organization's efforts to support the 2013 Fiji constitution development process. He's led in the development of CR's work in Papua New Guinea and in the front row there, we have Laura Reiku as well from CR working on that program. And that work includes supporting the peace process in the autonomous region of Bougainville and across the Pacific region where CR uh, aims to enhance existing peace building capabilities through comparative learning and also implements a program of work focused on climate change and conflict. For Southeast Asia, Kieran leads conciliation resources work in the Philippines, in the Bangsamoro region, where he's a member of the International Contact Group for the Bangsamoro Peace Process. Welcome, Kieran. And to, uh, to on our in person as well, we have Nathan Shea, who is the Assistant Director of the Asia Foundation's Conflict and Fragility Unit. We're getting to know a lot of the Asia Foundation staff. I'm sure you've, you've been meeting uh, people, so it's good to have Nathan with us. For the past decade, Nathan's been working on conflict, peace building, violent extremism and development research and programming across South and Southeast Asia. Nathan's authored numerous book chapters, peer reviewed journal articles and reports, including on the peace process in Aceh, Indonesia and in Mindanao, the Philippines. Nathan has a Masters of IR from the University of Melbourne. And within his work at the Asia Foundation is program manager for the cross-border local research network. And hovering above us is the fabulous Dr. Sia Darwish, who is an anthropologist and peace builder specialized in gender and environmental peace and conflict. As an applied academic, SIAD uses systems thinking to confront various intersecting forms of 
violence in theory and practice. He's a research associate with us at the Initiative for Peace Building, for environmental peace building, and leads CDA collaborative learning projects, participatory research project into the environmental fragility peace nexus. Siad holds a PhD in anthropology where he received a US National Science Foundation grant and an MA in Anthropology of Development from the University of Sussex. Siad's also uh, someone that uh, all three of us have had the pleasure of working with at various times. And so TAF, UniMalb and CR, I think you can float above us and feel that you're representing and <laughs> connecting to, to all of us, Siad. So yeah, that's right. So we've, uh, we've got the opportunity in this session to uh, try to touch on uh, some of the, the, the conflicts that um, we can acknowledge as being, uh, you know, a region that encompasses very complex and diverse conflicts with hybrid governance and complex development needs alongside uh, a myriad of, of dynamic peace processes that, that are underway. And so understandably in this short amount of time, uh, it'd be good if you could give some insight uh, into the sorts of conflict issues and trends that your work is grappling with and, and what sort of approaches uh, you're taking to those. And so perhaps Kieran, you might kindly give yeah. us some insight into your work. Hi everybody. Um... So yeah, just to, 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 I suppose, to preface this conversation, um, it's difficult to actually talk about conflict risks. Um, it sort of creates this sort of negative, um, I suppose, impression of a context, um, doom and gloom. Um, uh, the, each context we talk about has its own resiliency mechanisms, has its own society and its own society ways of building peace. But societies do fall back into conflict and they do fall into conflict. Um, being Northern Irish, I can attest to that. Um, and you, you drift into it. And I suppose as international organizations, we try to keep that sort of view on conflicts, but also recognizing um, that it's not all doom and gloom. But with that, I'll get into the doom and gloom. Um, so I suppose I have four, I suppose, main points or areas that I suppose we see as as, as conflict risks. I mean, you, you could say more broadly, globally, we are a global organization, but I, I suppose I'm specifically thinking of uh, Southeast Asia and the Pacific, more pointedly in, the, in Southeast Asia, the Philippines, and in the Pacific, uh, in particular, the Southeast South, uh, West Pacific region. Um, uh, first one I would point out is the failure of political processes. Um, political uh, and political processes, by their very nature, I'm talking about peace agreements. Also, can call them political settlements. Um, in particular, in conflict affected post conflict environments, um, they are, in a sense, at all the time, the glue that brings. The, con the divisions within a conflict together. Um, uh, typically, there are factions, there are groups within political elites that are part of these settlements, and they're driven and they're united by sometimes the momentum behind a peace agreement, uh, what has been agreed, um, the political compromises in that agreement. And I'll give a couple of examples. Um, and the I suppose the dangers of, of, of such failure. The Banks of Morrow, um, 2014 peace agreement led to uh, a new political arrangement in the Banks of Morrow, um, led by the MILF. And the MILF is a militia group that fought a war of, for, of, of self-determination. Um, the, the, the key for peace to be maintained, it's a big statement, but uh, I, I would put it more, it would be, difficult to see peace being maintained if the MILF cannot make that transition and maintain there is violence in this area of the, of the world, but more widespread violence. The MILF uh, are really anxious to make that transition from a militant group into a political group, which 
is much harder. The decision making processes, the norms, the political norms within uh, these groups moving from a militarized system into a political system. Um, uh, the um, say so the other example would be um, Bougainville peace agreement, uh, referendum on independence. Um, what is essential is or very important for maintaining peace is for you know for an agreement to be reached between the national government and the Bougainville government um, that enables peace. That could be independence or it could be an arrangement that satisfies the political needs of the Bougainvillians. With, with losing momentum, failure to uh, failure of these agreements really threaten peace in post-conflict environments. They loosen up divisions, factions, uh, politicians taking advantage. Um, I did say to Tanya to, to, to speed me up, so I'm going to have to. These are, as you can see, very complex things. So, but what does CEOR do, or what does an international organisation like ourselves do, um, as regards? that region of political peacemaking. Um, we get involved in what we call mediation support. So it can be facilitation, facilitating um, discussions between governments, facilitating relationships between civil societies. Um, a key part of what we do is also comparative learning. So in Bougainville, learning with South Sudan, we substantial amount of that. In the next couple of months, for example, a learning between Sinn Féin in Northern Ireland, successful, a political party that moves out, moved out of being a militia in a sense, uh, doing an exchange with the MILF to uh, around learnings about forming a political party. The other key part, the other key approach we would take um, in that sort of political level is around uh, civil society to government relations, holding these new governments to account, uh, learning governance through interaction with their people is the simplest way to describe it. Um, Second major risk, uh, and I think this is probably the core risk, um, central risk, is the failure to, to work on conflict issues in these conflict-affected societies. Uh, there is a tendency to have a peace agreement and we all walk away. Um, in actual fact, I will point out two. Um, one, dealing with the past. So societies dealing with the divisions, the trauma of violence of the past. Um, and also exclusion, the tendency to new political systems to exclude uh, can be ethnic groups, religious groups, but also women and youth. Um, approaches to this uh, work, and again, this is the I suppose it was the core work of conciliation resources, is supporting people in these conflict-affected societies to work on these issues themselves. This is not something an international NGO can do directly. So I would point to the work of the Nazareth Center um, in Bougainville and their work around really enabling leadership and leaders in Bougainville to analyze conflict, to analyze dealing with the past and, and, and develop their own peace building work. This is very, this is very localized. Um, conflict affects societies in a very localized way, the severity and not severity of, of, of conflict. So it is, it, it's highly localized lies work. I would also point out, point to partners in, in Bank Samoro working on peace building mechanisms within communities. Um, third, uh, Third conflict risk. How am I doing for time? Okay. Um, third co uh, conflict risk we would point out is climate change. Um, this is a relatively new area for conciliation resources. We we work. We have a program in the Pacific um, focused on climate change and conflict. Um, and I suppose what we began to recognise is the potential for climate change to exacerbate, uh, to multiply. Uh, existing conflict system, uh, existing conflict risks um, within quite complex conflict systems. So, point out a few things that are some of it quite obvious: land and resource um, competition. Um, these, in particular in, in conflict affected or post-conflict um, environments, uh, land and resource access to land and resources. 
uh, obviously will get is likely to get constrained. The effects of national and natural disasters, without getting into detail, but slightly obvious, it can damage the what I would call the resilience and the ability of communities, societies to be able to manage conflict themselves. Um, and governance, I think this is an area to be thought of. Think of a crisis, how governments react in crisis. It's highly exclusionary. It's the population demand direct responses, which excludes civil society, women, youth, and decision-making. And if you have continuous rolling crises, what is that gonna do for governance? Potential for increased authoritarian approaches to governance. Um, uh, just one last thing, one of the issues I think to confront on, on, on with regards to climate change is actually the intensity of development itself. Um, we know that development, if not analyzed correctly, not consulted correctly, can do harm. Um, and I, I, I think there's, that's an area uh, of concern, I suppose. The fourth point I would make, or the fourth risk I would highlight, um, and sorry, on, on climate change, getting into the responses. So the responses to climate change, um, I, I would look to, and this is again coming back to the type of work we have been doing, um, I think with climate change, there's a, a knowledge gap and an understanding gap. And I think I've been alluding to that from the beginning when it was regards to climate change. Um, I would look to uh, examples of our partner, the Pacific Center for Peace Building in Fiji, doing analysis, doing research within informal settlements to just basically understand the conflict dynamics within, uh, within informal settlements. Um, that are likely or liable to flooding as a result of climate change, to be affected by, by, by natural disasters. The other side of it is actually working in communities. Again, Transcend Oceania in Fiji is a good example, but also in, in the Bank Samoro, TLWI is a group that works in indigenous communities. Unifel Women is an organization that works with women in conflict-affected communities. Um, working with communities, to enable them to understand, uh, enable them to analyze future conflict, and again, to be able to develop their own responses to it. Um, the last area I would highlight as a conflict risk is gender. Um, and sort of an, an element of gender is around the role of masculinities, in particular male group behavior, male group dynamics. So focusing on men as groups, um, and, and, and I would I would sort of bring this out, I suppose, in the Pacific. If you look at violent conflict in the, and violence and societal level violence in the in the in um, in the Pacific, you're really looking at um, you know Hela or, or sorry the Highlands, Bougainville, uh, Solomon Islands, even to some degree past violent incidences in 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 Fiji. Um, they're not tend to be not structured command and control groups of men, right? They tend to be more loosely, uh, loose groupings, if you like. In Bougainville, that formed into sli something slightly more, more structured, but it starts out with groups of young men committing violence on, 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 on others, other groups. Um, and I think what's, as regards a response to that, I think in a lot of ways within the Pacific and really more broadly, there's not really the depth of understanding as to how this happens in particular at a, at a, at a more local or contextual level. So one of the things we would, we're, program we're trying to get off the ground is, um, is to, to look at masculinity, to ask the question of groups of men, to understand what are the identities uh, what are the narratives that are driving them to form into groups of men that commit violence um, beyond just the politics and the, that, that may drive this? Obviously, there's exclusion, there's economic exclusion, um, uh, but it's an area that we feel needs more wholesome look with it, in particular in the Pacific. The, the, that type of information, that type of knowledge will then help practitioners, as I've described earlier, to to, to, to target these groups, to target violence better, um, to target their work better within societies. That's great. Yeah, okay, thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks, Kieran. Um, I think that uh, bringing up 
you know, the importance of really thinking differently how we support um, political processes and, and struggles from violent to um, political peacemaking and peace building, but also emphasising uh, the importance of th those different scales and levels of ongoing work that, that gets done in, in community and by a whole range of actors is, is really important. And, and I know that uh, I'll look here, Siad, rather than over my shoulder, but I know that especially some of the things that you would have brought up uh, in relation to, to climate and, and gender I probably had Siad nodding. So it might be a good opportunity, Siad, for, for you to also speak to some of the work that you've been involved in and how you see responses to some of those um, risks and, and opportunities in this work. Thank you, Tanya. And hello, everybody. Um, as Tanya has said, uh, we get to all work together in different capacities. And I get to work um, as an independent consultant with governments um, and intergovernmental organizations across the Asia Pacific quite a lot. So I get small insights, but I want to talk about a particular topic and actually highlight some of the things and go deeper into some of the things that Kieran mentioned. And particularly, I'd like to talk about um, environmental peace building in the Asia Pacific region. And with uh, the University of Melbourne and other universities, we've organized a conference about a year ago on that issue. And it was uh, astounding, the, the, the sort of uh, approaches that already existed that not very many people had looked at. Um, so I'd like to talk about that a little bit. So environmental peace building, broadly, there's many definitions out there, but generally speaking, environmental peace building integrates natural resource management and conflict prevention, mitigation and resolution and recovery to build more resilient communities affected by conflict. Right? Resilient is this dreaded development term that means a lot of different things for a lot of people. It, it means, um, you know, returning to a state of equilibrium, right? Returning back to a state where things are working really well for everyone. But uh, I like to prescribe to an SES approach that really says thriving in the face of adversity, right? So what, what can communities or what can communities and nature together, so socio-natural systems do to thrive in the face of adversity? And while we always talk about doom and gloom and while environmental peace building comes out of this sort of doom and gloom understanding, climate change will you know, have these terrible impacts on the world, which it has, and they will result in conflict, right? Um, fight massive fights for water resources or land resources. For a long time, that has been the prediction. And certainly from a security point of view, that is often the key point. But it turns out that it goes both ways, right? So we see a huge amount of cooperation um, and have seen a huge amount of cooperation con consistently um, in the face of disaster. Um, I lived on the South Coast during the fires in Australia, for example, and people like the community really pulled together. And so the Asia Pacific region being the most disaster prone region in the world actually has shown a huge amount of resilience, right? Communities coming together and communities connecting with the ecology in order to thrive and bounce back and being really quick and dynamic on their feet in the way that they organize societies, in the way that economies are structured. So a huge amount of learning that can be done that is particularly localized and on the local level. So some of the key issues um, around environmental peace building in the Asia Pacific region is really, one is disaster, right? And we really thinking about uh, large scale, so, so, so um, cyclones, hurricanes, and so on. But in Australia, we see the, 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 the floods, the fires. It is a very disaster prone part of the world. And it turns out that the way that we uh, prepare for disaster can also inoculate societies against this moment where disaster result, uh, results in resource competition, right? We can actually do quite a lot of work um, in the build-up to disaster uh, with disaster risk reduction, if we do that in a conflict-sensitive manner, to help people pull together, have the resources, um, cooperate. And really what we should be doing more is cooperate across borders also, right? Because often these kind of disasters increasingly are not affecting only one country. Resource pressures increasingly impact by extra, uh, in, um, impacted on by extractive industries and climate change exp exposure are feeding into conflict dynamics. So really, environmental peace building means embracing complexity. Uh, 
conflicts themselves are incredibly complex things, right? If you ever worked on one, you can see there is six, seven, eight drivers that are historical, they're economic, they're social, and they all interact. So we have to get better at accepting that we don't have the answers, that these are conflicts, uh, conflict and environmental changes that are interacting, constantly changing, and we have to embrace that complexity and sort of be humble about our approaches to them rather than saying, uh, we have all the solutions, this is what needs to be done and it'll be solved. We got to sort of monitor and learn from the ground and learn as we develop and, uh, and understand these kind of impacts. The field in, in certain ways, and certainly in practice, as Kieran also said, is um, in its very beginnings. Um, and climate change and extractive industries really across the Asia Pacific in very many contexts are really um, highly interlinked. Of course, right, extractive industries are causing climate change, but also the sort of land competition that happens through climate impacts is often exasperated by extractive industries in the area. So that gives us a kind of idea, and I come back to that, what actually security might mean, right? We have to think about the kind of extractive practices in the region and see them as a security threat in themselves. Migration really is starting to um, uh, feed into conflict, but not in the way that everyone was thinking. Um, and Tanya also, please tell me if I'm, how I'm doing with time uh, at some point. Now, really what we're seeing broadly, and this is a global phenomenon, we're not seeing climate migrants, you know, from the Pacific Islands or Asia knocking on the door of Australia and, and you know, um, more advanced economies. What we're seeing is a huge amount of internal migration, particularly from rural areas that are already strained by COVID-19, already strained by faltering economies, um, and then climate impacts might affect rural livelihoods and we see a move to the cities. And this really is the, the major migration trend across the uh, region, is really a move from country to city in the context of disaster. And that, that does produce all sorts of tensions in urban centers. And it turns out urban centers are really what we should focus on to a large degree. Although livelihoods in the countryside matter, a lot of the conflict is happening in informal settlements that are exploding in the context of climate change across the cities of the Asia Pacific region. And we are not documenting it. We're not looking at it enough. We're not understanding the dynamics um, closely enough. There is great organizations that are doing that, like um, the Pacific Center for Peace Building, like other organizations across the region, but we're not paying enough attention to this dynamic. Um, the region has always been really, really rich in approaches to uh, conflict management, right? And particularly indigenous approaches are incredibly varied, but they exist everywhere. And what they have, um, what they have over a lot of Western liberal approaches to conflict management is that they already think about society and the environment in an integrated manner. The two in most of the ontologies of the Asia Pacific, particularly of indigenous people, they are integrated. So we're coming sort of late to the party as West peace builders were trained in Western approaches, thinking it's like, oh, we're working on these societal problems. There's these environmental impacts. How can these two fit together? Turns out that most of the indigenous approaches across the region have done that all along. They think of a different kind of peace, a peace that really means um, a healthy environment and a healthy society and a healthy, often spiritual and um, economic and different kinds of relationships between you know, the environment and people. Um, one that really increasingly we're seeing, and that is quite big in the Asia Pacific region also that Kieran talked about is, um, uh, you know, uh, low carbon development. So climate responses are producing a huge amount of conflicts. Uh, there's a lot of work on Red Plus on sort of, you know, um, forestry carbon offset initiatives that are producing localized conflicts. And, these, and we're not seeing them because they are very localized, they're often rural areas in forests. They're not the sort of conflicts that people are looking at um, when they do like a geopolitical assessment of, an, of a region, but they are everywhere. So really the kind of responses aren't um, appropriate at the moment. And then very quickly, just to finish up, is we have to really rethink what in these kind of ontologies where people are losing their land, their, their ancestral lands in the context of climate change, where they're migrating from rural, um, rural lifestyles to urban uh, centers, to informal settlement, settlements, to slums often, right? Um, 
we have to really th rethink what violence means for us as conf in conflict management. Violence and exclusion in particular, because the people who are hardest hit is not just the poorest people, it is also um, women are more affected by men within patriarchal resource you know, distribution systems. So we really have to reassess what we mean by violence and what kind of violence is being, um, violence and exclusion is happening at the moment in the context of climate change. And that also brings us to a different kind of question of peace and security. Once we understand that violence is environmental and structural, and then we really have to think about a kind of sort of different ge geopolitical approach to um, security in the region, one that includes such things as addressing what extractive industries have done for centuries across the region. There's really strong, in this sort of climate, the climate effects, there's really strong colonial echoes in that resource extraction that um, produces loss of land and loss of culture in certain ways and new ways of dealing with that. So we really have to think deeply about that. Um, and I think for now, that is all I have to say. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much, Ziad. Uh, and actually, whilst you're, you're not with us, um, a, a lot of the things that you say sit deeply under some of the conversations that have been uh, shared over the last couple of days, but you've uh, given a really important ecological peace building perspective that um, really resonates with some of the, the issues. So thanks, Siad. We'll come back to you. But uh, Nathan, it'd be great to hear from, from you as well, from some of the work you've been doing uh, in the Southeast Asia region as well, from with the same sort of idea of what, what you see as some of those conflict risks and trends and how the work at TAF has been um, engaged on those. Thanks, Tanya. Um, and it's excellent to be here. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here on Nanamal land um, and to be able to share with you some of our experiences uh, from uh, the Asia region, primarily focusing on uh, South Asia and Southeast Asia um, and the various different contexts and conflicts that uh, we, we work in across that region. Um, I agree. It, it's, it's very difficult to summarize, uh, to, to come up with a, a a short list, I guess, of conflict drivers, particularly when there's so much diversity across this region and each conflict is unique. Um, and the drivers that feed into that are, are quite unique. And it's very important to be able to understand and unpack, understand those drivers on the ground, um, often which can be at, at quite a local level, as Siad was just saying. Um, but I will try to sort of bring out uh, three uh, trends around conflict that we are, we are seeing across the region and start to unpack, um, you know, with the impacts of those. Uh, the first one that I'd like to highlight is around um, the continuation and the continued persistence of subnational uh, and successionist conflicts or conflicts that are based around self-determination um, uh, approaches uh, and desires. Uh, through some work that the Age Foundation has done, including reports such as the Contested Corners of Asia report and the Contested Areas of Myanmar report, uh, we've very much looked, been focusing on these as sort of the um, you know, somewhat hidden, but um, definitely still active uh, conflicts across the region. Myanmar is the most obvious and significant case of that in uh, today, um, not just because of the conflict that has uh, increased uh, and, and broken out since the the uh, the coup and the uh, after the elections in 2020, but obviously the 70 years of legacy that there is around subnational conflict in that region and the various ethnic armed groups across the country that are looking to uh, gain their own uh, autonomy or, or self um, determination and how that of course feeds into the 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 post-coup environment is an incredibly um, diverse, difficult, uh, and dangerous um, uh, environment that's ongoing. Um, I just lost my notes. That's okay. <laughs> Luckily, I know what I'm roughly talking about. Um, we're not just talking about Myanmar, though. Um, there are other subnational conflicts uh, across the region, um, and obviously, um, we've seen an increase in violence in southern Thailand this year, which is concerning. There are uh, ongoing uh, challenges around um, governance issues in parts of Pakistan, particularly the, the ex-Fata uh, areas that have been incorporated into Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and the various uh, governance-related uh, conflict challenges that are there that intersect with violent extremism and, and uh, the Taliban group in the region. Um, but even in areas where 
uh, the guns have fallen silent or peace agreements have been signed, there are there's an ongoing continuation of peace work that needs to be done on, on various different conflict issues and conflict drivers. Um, you know, for example, in we're talking about the Philippines, obviously it's excellent that the MILF is now uh, you know completed an agreement with the government and there's an ongoing governance process there. Um, but one of the main conflict drivers in that region remains to be clan feuding and intercommunal violence. And so even though there might be a peace agreement, there's other uh, conflict drivers that are existing in these areas that need to be resolved. Uh, and this brings me to uh, the second of the uh, conflict trends that I would like to um, highlight, which is uh, around identity-based conflict. Um, we uh, through the Asia Foundation, we also have another series of reports called uh, The State of Conflict and Violence in Asia. Uh, there was a seven, 2017 report and then a, a recent one 20, that came out in 2021 that really focused on the, the increase and the prevalence of identity-based conflict across the region. Um, and this is happening and taking place within the context of um, a changing governmental uh, system in the area. We're seeing the increase of uh, well, we're seeing democratic backsliding across the a region, uh, an increase in illiberal de democratic activity, um, the increase in authoritarianism, um, and the explosion of populism, divisive politics, and other um, uh, changes in the in the government systems across the the, the region. Uh, and this is leading to a, a, a an increase on the way in which identity-based conflicts uh, perpetrated across that region. Uh, particularly used as a political device to be able to uh, gain political capital and to, by, to, to, for political ends by governments and other um, political leaders in the region. And so what this means is and what this leads to is greater marginalization of minority groups um, and persecution of minority groups in the area. Um, whether that be ethnic or religious or otherwise, um, and the various other uh, impacts that feed into a, a real increase in identity-based conflict um, in various countries. And we've seen that um, not just in uh, places like Myanmar with the persecution of Rohingya um, and Sri Lanka and, and Bangladesh, um, but elsewhere. And this trend is being um, is being sped up and pushed by the uh, by by online by the online and the way in which online media, social media, is is pushing and uh, propelling this conflict trend. Um, for example, uh, the sharing of a video in Bangladesh last year of a which perceived to be of, of, a, of a Hindu person burning a Quran led to you know outbreak of violence and you know attacks on 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 Hindu communities. Those sorts of incidences are becoming more more common. Um, and the uh, and, and, and interacting in negative ways across the region. Um, the last topic trend that I'll highlight uh, is built off a, a series of work that we've been doing through uh, a project awkwardly titled the Cross Border Conflict Evidence Policy and Trends Program, or Accept. Uh, it's a that was a donor creation. I can tell you that. Uh, but uh, this project is, very, is looking at conflicts in uh, border regions and looking at how communities in those border regions in particular um, experience conflict. And one of the key trends that is coming out of that is an overall increase in our region of, um, of securitization and the over-securitization of border regions and, 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 fragile, and, and fragile and conflict affected areas. I think this is more prominent we're seeing in South Asia at the moment, but there is obviously a risk that will also extend to Southeast Asia. Um, and what does this look like? We are seeing the, you know, the increasing of, um, of, of governments looking to extend um, and ex extend security into different regions. Um, in the State of Conflict and Violence in Asia report, we actually, we actually track over, say, a 10, 15 year period using um, Uppsala conflict data program data that that deaths or fatalities from violent conflict have actually decreased across South and Southeast Asia over the last 10, 15 years. But on the on the um, on the flip side of that is the greater capacity for governments to be able to create to crack down on on perceived violence and conflict affected areas and to in this increase in securitization. We see this through the building of uh, 
border fences along the Afghanistan Pakistan border and the the, the, the increase the establishment of um, uh, new border terminals, the, the the formation of paramilitary groups and border guard uh, border guard forces and other militia to be able to control certain areas. Um, the, the fencing of the Rohingya camps in Cox's Bazaar and the way in which Rohingya have been prevented from uh, a, a access to education, livelihoods, um, and to be able to you know, run market stalls in those areas. Um, and what this is doing is this is having a real negative impact on uh, people's access to livelihoods, education. Uh, it is um, undermining and destroying uh, indigenous forms of governance and justice practices. It is limiting opportunities for mobility and migration um, and you know, various other impacts around health and otherwise, very, various other developmental uh, impacts around, that, that feed into conflict. Um, and so... Uh, yeah, this, 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 this over-securitization of these regions is, is a trend that is unfortunately um, then becomes a conflict driver in itself because people react negatively to, to the limited limitations on livelihoods and other sorts of mobility issues that, that come out of these areas. Um, so what are we doing about that and how am I going? Okay, quickly. Um, a few things, I think. Uh, the Age Foundation, we're still very much investing in the deep uh, analysis and research of conflict-affected environments with a very key focus on policy action. That is, um, we, we need to be able to understand what is driving conflict in these areas and the various, and the, the milieu of conflict drivers in these areas because they're not uh, disconnected. They are, you know, interconnected and, and interrelate to each other. Uh, so that's a key part of the conversation. I can elaborate on that further. Um, but the second um, aspect also is that, um, you know, we, like uh, Conciliation Resources and others, there is a strong investment in um, local organization and lo local organizations and local peace actors to be able to pursue um, uh, indigenous forms and, and other types of activity in their region. Um, and so I think that is a, a key takeaway is that, there are issues in these areas, but there's also local solutions that need to be promoted and working with those actors and with those groups um, is an important and key part of that. Thanks, Nathan, Siad and, and Kieran. Uh, we're hearing, uh, it's really hard, I agree, to, to summarise some of those key areas that you're working with, but I do think that's really given us a sense of um, some of the important aspects of, of both the conflict context where, where you've been working, but also that these are um, really uh, complex and um, ongoing processes that uh, are led by by local actors, despite uh, various forms of interventions, and that CR, TAF, CDA, and and the initiative are sort of what I'm hearing is some of the support is focused on really uh, deep grounded analysis and how that can support both understanding of of the conflict, the the uh, complexities, but also opportunities that might be there, as you said, whether it's influencing po policy or supporting uh, conflict actors. And secondly, the importance of the, the long-term dynamic nature of these processes. I think that that's just so challenging because often conflicts come uh, into, into um, the fore, whether that be in terms of support or funding or media um, at certain points in time, and that wanes again. And, and what we've learned, as, as Kieran summarised, is that we've got really outdated ways of thinking about um, political processes, and we've got uh, a deep history of uh, innovative, important ways of resolving conflicts that often uh, locally and uh, not yet translating to uh, the way in which uh, people have been doing that. And so I think that some of that support describing things like holding spaces, opportunities for comparative learning so that those lessons are surfaced and those wisdoms are translated into approaches is, is really important work. But 
I guess some of that um, work to try to nudge meaningful change in some of the deeper cultural or structural aspects of, of conflict so that they're not um, uh, repeated over time is, is really challenging and it goes against a lot of the ways in which um, uh, the work is is seen and funded. And so I, I, I'm also interested that over the last couple of days, violent conflict or various forms of conflict hasn't come up too much in the discussion, even though um, it's really uh, such a, uh, you know, it's such a, an important aspect of both uh, Australian and regional uh, experiences. And so it's, it, it's interesting if we could um, move to, to a second question, which is in light of you know, a lot of us have been madly writing our submissions for the International <laughs> uh, Development Policy Review. We've been watering those seeds in dry soil for a long time of the hopes and aspirations we have for what we can and could be doing better to support some of uh, those aspects of um, of, of how we, we work on some of these issues. And I think for uh, a lot of people, they probably don't realise that a lot of the peace building work is actually funded out of the aid budget, which has been uh, a tiny part of a tiny budget, <laughs> and that there hasn't been a lot of public funding or philanthropic funding that um, has, has supported some of the work that you've been doing that uh, is ongoing, because these are relationships with people who shift and change in, in what they're working on. And, and so... Uh, out of the doom and gloom and to the um, to the actual reality of people doing really good work in a lot of places for a very long time, how would countries like Australia in their uh, programs for support uh, do that better for the type of work that, that you've been involved in? And uh, who shall I go to first, Siad? Thank you, Tanya. Um, I, I, I'd be somewhat swift. Um, I mean, on, on, on the whole, like acknowledging the kind of conflict. When we, as peace builders, talk about conflict, we're not talking about people shooting each other in the streets. We're talking about latent conflicts that exist across all societies, including democratic ones. Um, and to ignore these kind of conflicts that can spill over into uh, physical violence, but even if it's not physical violence, exclusion and structural violence can feel can feel just as bad to a lot of people. To ignore the kind of conflicts that are happening in the region by not focusing on managing them and preventing them uh, is short-sighted in general. Um, in terms of environmental peace building in particular, uh, even if you would have you would have looked 20 or 30 years ago in terms of dis discussions about climate change, the Asia Pacific was at the center of those discussions, but it's still not at the center of talking about environmental peace building at all. Um, hardly any of the evidence comes from this part of the world, even though a huge amount of work has always been done on the intersection between conflict, peace and the environment. So we have a lot of a lot of learning to do in this region specific to this region where most of the examples and most of the case evidence comes really from sub-saharan africa and the middle east across the world so we, we don't understand this region very well in in environmental peace building terms there's a huge theory practice gap uh, in the field the field uh, itself has really evolved on a, th on a theoretical basis but what people are doing on the ground and the kind of uh, frameworks that they need in order to respond to drastic environmental change and environmental conflict together, we still don't really have them, um, particularly on a sort of grassroots level. Um, as CR does, there's a lot of comparative learning to be done. Um, we have to rethink, I mean, really from, a, from an Australian perspective, we really have to rethink what security means and what the geopolitics of the region means. If we think about climate change and its interaction with um, conflicts across the region and we're seeing that interaction when we look, especially, especially in a, on a community level, that means really rethinking what security means across the region, meaning climate policy in fact is a security issue, right, and, and, and the other way around. So we have to think about new solidarities between different arms of government, between different organizations that are working together in order to address these together. 
Um, and of course, in Australia itself, there's a lot to be learned about um, environmental destruction, you know, a colonial state. Um, we have, um, you know, indigenous populations within Australia that have a lot to say about what environmental peace building might look like. What does it look like to live, you know, um, in, in with clo closer ties with the environment and think of peace as something that doesn't just concern uh, humans alone. So there's a lot to be learned. Um, even in Australia itself. And clearly, as we're seeing over the last years, Australia itself is being affected by this. So um, that's all I have to say for now. Thank you. Thank you, Sia. Nathan. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, I think, um, so So, what are the implications for aid donors when we're talking about peace building? Um, and I think one thing that we really need to see is the greater recognition within aid donor countries of the inter inter interconnectivity um, and diversity of conflict drivers. And, um, you know, as, as Sia is just saying, conflict is not, when we're talking about conflict, we're not just talking about people uh, killing each other or, you know, armed groups, uh, armed group activity, but we're very much talking about various forms of structural violence, inequalities, and, and otherwise that, you know, exist across our region. Um, and being able to have, it's, you know, the, the, the ongoing importance of being able to have a detailed understanding of these conflict drivers and how they interconnect in, in different environments, in specific environments, um, is incredibly important. So being able to understand, you know, the differences between, um, you know, what, what conflict looks like, looks like in, say, Lanao de Sur in the Banque Samaro versus Sulu in the Banque Samaro, and really having that fine grained knowledge about how conflict permeates in these areas. Um, and, you know, alongside that, I think we also need to see a greater recognition that because of these, the, inter the interconnectivity of conflict drivers, that really effective development must include peace building as a core component of that. I think that needs to be highly recognized at a development aid conference that peace building is, is incredibly important to that and peace building done incorrectly or not at all can lead to negative development indicators and development outcomes across our region so this means um you know broadly that you know peace building uh do no harm practices or uh, conflict mitigation practices need to be built into all development projects that we're working in and thinking about what is the uh, what is the intervention that we're making and how is that affecting uh, social, political and economic uh, realities on the ground? And how might that be a conflict driver or, or actually lead to a, a preventative activity? Um, but more broadly, um, the, the types of interventions that can be made to try and prevent conflict can actually be, a, a, a generally actually can be quite standard um, uh, development practices and so you know use the example of the deteriorating security situation in cox's bazaar and the rohingya camps um you know what is driving the increase in illicit um smuggling of drugs and crime in that area well a number of things but one of them is that um there are very very limited opportunities for a uh, illicit income in that area and very uh, few opportunities for an education in those areas and so young men uh are looking to provide for their families or looking for other activities are essentially pushed into an illicit criminal path because of the lack of opportunities in in more illicit activities and so the interventions that can be uh you know created in that area are interventions around livelihoods and education you know the, the bread and butter of development um activities that that aren't you know niche peace building ones if it would be um and i might have then quickly just say that um uh, quickly something about money and, and financing and funding for peace building activities um i think we need to have some humility in the work that we do uh, all of us do as development actors the a recognition that um that particularly in asia uh there is the impacts that we can make through the small funding that comes from the, the, the small financial scale of the development activities that we that we do um, will have limited results compared to the other forms of domestic and, and other domestic conditions and, and political calculations in those areas. And so that means that the interventions need to be incredibly targeted and also need to be, um, you know, need to be backed by 
financing that is both long term and um, and nimble in being able to be, be deployed and respond to specific areas where impacts can be made. Uh, I think the the the, the, the period of just having large buckets of funding and money that go into a peace process has uh, had mixed, if not negative results in, in certain areas, but being able to target programs in a more effective way is, is an important part. And I think it's a conversation between uh, the P international peace building community, uh, the local peace building community who have much better understanding on, on the ground and international donors to be able to, to develop and implement those um, interventions. That's great. Thank you, Nathan. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I suppose looking at DFAT, the Australian government internally, a simple, I think a simple fact uh, perhaps sums it up. Somebody may fact check me wrong here, but my understanding is that Australia is the only or one of the only members of the G20 that does not have a unit or a, gr a grouping within DFAT that focuses on conflict and, and analyzes conflict. And I think that's quite telling and it's really telling and it's really, that's how we experience it as well. We have donors from all around the world funding work in the Pacific and, and um, in the Banks of Moro and not to shame our colleagues, but it, they're fundamentally different conversations at, uh, quite often, quite fundamentally different conversations. And we got to think of the risks and the, the, I mean, as, as, as our friends have highlighted, the understanding of the context is crucial. If you're investing money in a conflict-affected society, you need to be conflict-aware, right? And that's what every, every aid, any of these G20 uh, countries recognize. And that doesn't exist within DFAT. Um, I'll highlight some of the dangers. Um, you know, it, it, and, and it, it's quite broad, broad scope, but uh, without that ana analysis, um, that type of embedded long-term analysis, understanding the drivers of conflict, a, a, Australia, a country without that type of analysis, will be drawn into sort of more reactive responses. Uh, reactive responses without even having the understanding whether that reaction, the reactive response, could actually be a, another driver of conflict. Mm. These are really crucial uh, crucial issues in the Pacific um, and, a, and a key gap in, in Australia. Um, it, it, it will tend to lead to more securitized approaches. And I think as Ziad was highlighting, such, such approaches can become part of the driver of conflict, can play into uh, factions, um, can favor factions, dri again, driving conflict. This is, this is obviously complex stuff that needs complex analysis. Um, sort of getting into sort of aid in itself and and the needs of peace building. Um, conflict affects societies are very complex. I mean, societies are complex. Um, but you're talking about deep divisions in different parts of, of a geography, different types of divisions, different types of exclusions um, that all come from, in particular, uh, come from the, the violent period uh, or tend to come from the, the violent period that that conflict affected society um, experienced. And, there, you know, the longer that level of violence, then the more complex it is, um, or tends to be. Um, what that leads to is that level of complexity, yeah. without getting in depth into complexity theory and how it affects it, and I know the development sector really looks at this, or trying to look at this, um, with peace building, it really needs adaptive approaches. What you do one day could be simply useless two weeks later. And you need a constant analysis and understanding of uh, the conflict system, as we describe it. Um, also with that, so you know, in other words, you could be doing something that not only um, is useless, but can actually be doing harm. What you're act with the other thing you're not doing is looking for opportunities. In such complex dynamic environments, a youth group could suddenly form that needs support to be able to insert itself into a process. If organizations like, like ourselves don't have the flexibility to be able to support that group and the understanding from the donor that that is what's needed now instead of that, which is something we confront quite quite often, um, that type of, of, of sort of interaction with donors, um, then that opportunity gets missed. Um, the other thing to focus on, civil society. Civil society is a key part. You'll find that 
you know, militias, politicians, they're, pol they're politicians and they're, they're working through a conflicted political system. Civil society understands that political system, understands the, uh, the conflict issues in its own society uh, and need to be enabled, need to be resourced to do their work. Um, I will say time, indigenous approaches, I think they've already mentioned, time is a crucial element, you know, aid cycles and, and, and this sort of uh, linear approach to, to, to funding and short termist is a real hindrance to, to organizations like ourselves. And the other thing is, is, is analysis. The work that we do as conciliation resources needs day to day analysis. We need to spend a lot of time <laughs> focus on the context for the reasons I just laid out. Um, and this is the type of thing that, that donors tend to not want to fund. Um, uh, for, for us not to do harm, for example. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it there. And I didn't, hopefully I'm not shaming um, some of you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And thanks. Uh, I Just picking up on that last one in relation to analysis, it's actually often participatory. We're talking about forms of engagement where you're trying to um, increase opportunities to share different perspectives, to um, offer alternative narratives and, and, and perspectives. And, and like you said, that that's um, something that uh, also often doesn't go against those linear cycles where you're asked to do something once and move on, whereas we, we return and we seek alignment and you seek to challenge or, or change um, approaches. And, and also when you're talking about different types of actors, I mean, we're also seeing, you know, how important uh, mass movements are and civil resistance movements and they also challenge the idea of how you engage when there isn't a, a representative or an association or a, a bank fund to transfer into and and so on there's lots of those aspects of the complexity but um, we we've done our very best to keep to time so that we've got a full half hour to be in conversation with with you so it'd be wonderful to um, yes we've got a hand up uh, Oh, it sounds like you've got a good. <laughs> Liam Spear. Hello, uh, my name is Liam Four, and I work for a group called the Peace Dividend Initiative. I wanted to pick up on the discussion around funding, um, with the conflict in Ukraine and the impact on businesses and global economy. Is there not a role for the private sector to start stepping in and philanthropists to fund this like they did after World War II and really put a lot of money into building peace and stability? Uh, thank you very much for the presentations. Uh, I'm Sita Giri, currently teaching at Asian Institute of Management, uh, Philippines. And I've worked with UN for the last 20 years and had the opportunity to work in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Bangladesh, where I worked over four years. And all the information you gave, the cases that you presented, resonates very well with what I've seen out in the field. Um, talk about the, the conflicts, the impact of the climate change, the natural disasters that's happening in these countries constantly. Um, my question is to Kiran, uh, you mentioned about the conflict risks, the tendency of new uh, political system to exclude ethnic minorities, um, women, and also exacerbate gender inequality. And actually, I'm just coming from a mission in Kabul directly to Canberra. And this, like, it's so evident uh, what's happening there in Afghanistan after the Taliban has taken over and the de facto authorities there. So my question is, is there any literature example that we see where we see such crisis stabilizing or evolving? And what would be the enabling factors for that? I mean, it's a very complex situation, but any examples, literature on that? Thank you, Sipak. I might take one more question. Um, or maybe two. <laughs> yeah. 
Hello, my name's Christy and I work at DFAT. Um, but my question is not related to that fact. I just wanted, you know, you, you had said, hopefully I don't offend anyone and I thought it was funny. Um, so my question is around uh, the conflict that's currently happening to do with the Rohingya crisis in Myanmar. It's kind of, to me, a perfect storm. I've spent quite a bit of time thinking about it. This over-securitization, the ethnic conflict, the language barriers, the lack of uh, licit means, meaningful, gainful employment, education seems like a perfect storm to me. And in in my head, there's just, I, I also, similar question, what do you see as stabilizing factors in such a complex operating environment? You know, Bangladesh wanting to resettle the Myanmar saying, you know, no to that, obviously. And this ongoing, uh, you know, after the coup, the the junta wanting to, to be legitimized as a political party when that is not the right thing to do and civil society organizations being imprisoned and therefore not being able to be part of the peace building process what happens then you know like the importance of civil society but then when they're kind of ruled out and you, you can't actually access those civil society organizations it's i'm interested to hear your thoughts as to what could change for the better thanks kirsty and our, our last in this set and then we'll have another Thanks very much to all the speakers. Um, my name's Rob. I'm from a development consultancy called Sustinio. Um, I wanted to ask, sort of in the face of this great power re-engagement in the Pacific and the sort of heightened potential for geopolitical conflict there, what can we as a development community do to support um, local peace building actors to react to those kind of bigger global trends rather than some of the more local drivers of conflict you've talked about? Thank you. And was it Rocco? Did you? Rob. Rob, sorry. Um, <laughs> I have an Italian heritage, so I hear things. <laughs> okay. So Liam, I'm wondering if, um, if Sia, did you want to take Liam's question in regard to the business sector and uh, engagement and support for peace building? Because I know that I was just thinking CDA, uh, some of the work they've done engaging with the business sector. Maybe mm. I should have let you volunteer. <laughs> First of all, uh, hello, Liam. We know each other too. <laughs> we have lots of connections. Um, good to see you again. And Liam actually would be able to speak about this a lot better than I can. Um, but of course, if we do think about environmental peace building, in particular in the region, we, um, we most of the time we, we talk about climate change. But really in the region, if we, we look at environmental conflict, key environmental conflicts have happened around extractive industries in particular. Um, from my humble experience that I have across the region, uh, extractive industries have caused a huge amount of conflict uh, on a local level in the region. Pretty much wherever, wherever they turn up, uh, land conflicts ensue. They feed into existing power dynamics, exclusion, the sexual economies that, that, that explode around extractive industries. And so um, there's very many different angles you could take on this, but I think in this region in particular, talk from an environmental peace building angle, I think engaging um, particularly extractive industries on the kind of conflicts that are ongoing and on future conflicts, right? There's a um, Bougainville, for example, is one where, where extractive industries very centrally play into it. And so having an, a better understanding of um, what that means and sort of also giving back to the communities in, in, an, in, an, in this um, respect uh, would be great. CDA has worked with a lot of extractive industries across the world. We do some work in the Pacific, but actually a lot more in Latin America and other places where um, it often feels a little bit like right, um, bargaining with the devil, <laughs> I would say it. Uh, but but it, it does mean that particularly what Kieran said, conflict sensitivity is absolutely essential. And of course, in an environment where particularly Australia uh, does not spend a huge amount of money on conflict prevention, but has a, a, a huge amount of Australian extractive um, companies have a huge amount of interest in the region um, that should definitely be uh, mobilized. Right? We should have more open discussions of what that means. We should have more open discussions also with how security, climate change and act, uh, ex, uh, extractive industries in the region come together. So I think um, that whole area is incredibly underdeveloped. 
um, and far more underdeveloped in this region than other parts of the world that I've worked in. So thank you, Liam. Thanks, Liam. Yeah, it's uh, certainly something that comes up regularly in terms of how to better engage uh, the business sector in, in constructive ways around this. And I know that Interpeace, a colleague from Interpeace was saying they're also looking into things, uh, you know, trying to think of different ways to, to think about um, uh, collective business approaches to to peace support, but um, I'll for time I'll move to uh, CPAC's question. Kieran, if you're happy to to speak to CPAC's question, that was on inclusion and yeah, um, yeah. I think that the direct question was: Is there an example of of um, a, a post conflict environment stabilizing? But just coming back to your comment about inclusion. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the, the post-conflict political settlements, peace agreements, they tend to be between militia and government. They tend to be male-dominated, highly, highly patriarchal environments, right? And that, from my own experience of sitting in the room facilitating this, it's, it tends to be men. And it's very difficult to get women into that room. And, and I think that it takes a lot of work. Some of what we do in Bougainville, actually, is to try and to get women involved in that. So, for example, in Bougainville, working with um, sort of civil society, women leaders, to sort of be ahead of the game. So be prepared for the constitution development process that is coming up in Bougainville. So to have the knowledge and, and, and ability to engage in a constructive way. And I think that sometimes that's when it comes to peace work, that when I talk about mediation support, it's the type of thing that we think about. How do you get, how do you broaden out the table? Um, uh, but at the same time, then with these political arrangements, they invariably end up as typically mostly male-dominated um, uh, political systems. And I don't think that's really new to anywhere in the world, let alone conflict-affected parts of the world. But it is, it, I mean, and this is an ongoing uh, work in a sense, is ensuring that women are included not only at tables, but included in policy making, included in decision making, and in particular in post-conflict and conflict-affected areas. Um, uh, and likewise youth and likewise other groups. Um, uh, the, uh, an example of, of where a conflict is stabilized, I think it's, it's difficult. Post-conflict environments, um, you know, the, the question is, do they ever normalize, <laughs> you know, within the bounds of generations, can they? Um, and, and I think these are difficult questions. And what is normal and what is stable? Um, very anecdotal and slightly crazy, but you know where I come from. Somebody mentioned the name related to somebody from Ireland, and my little synopsis goes, "That person's Protestant," and immediately I went, "This is what it means," and and that's my experience, and it's very bizarre the work I do, but I, I can't help it. It's like it's stuck there, and 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 it's and these things get passed down from generations. So how do we create settlements? How do we create political arrangement? How do we create society? more to the point how does society do this for themselves where they deal with these things where i will come back even with my anecdote and say looking at northern ireland there is a level of there is that level of stability right it hasn't come back to societal level violence um and why um uh, and i suppose i'm using that as an example because it's what i know um time a lot of time i mean the peace agreement was, what was it 1998 a long time ago um there's, there is a strong emphasis on inclusion in a lot of the processes in, in, in Northern Ireland. So inclusion of different groups, even the political arrangement itself is based on inclusion. Um, but what has tripped it up is justice and dealing with the past. And I would come back to that as if you can, if you can figure that one out, <laughs> uh, if a society can figure out how to deal with truth, how to figure out what is truth, in a in a in a conflict affected society, and then deal with it. Um, you, that's where you will find longer term stability. And of course, we're finding our way still in Australia on, on those very issues. Um, but I note, um, Kieran, that you started to touch on issues. I think Kirsty's question spoke to as well in the context of Myanmar in the context of Mira, and I yeah. thought maybe Nathan, did you want to, to speak to that? Yeah, it, it, 
Thank you for the question. Um, it's obviously a very difficult situation to be able to to work on, um, both in uh, in Cox's Bazaar itself with the refugee community there, but then even much more difficult across the border in, in Rakhine State. Um, so finding stabilizing factors in that environment is, you know, is a difficult task. Um, and perhaps I'll draw mostly on, I think, what can be done with the refugee community. Um, and maybe we can have a conversation afterwards about what could be done about Northern Rakhine. Um, but there is a great amount of um, agency, ingenuity, activity within the refugee community that isn't properly capital capitalized upon. And it's actually, unfortunately, I would say being actively suppressed by the camp authorities and the Bangladesh government. Um, you know, there there was a vibrant market system in the camps and trading uh, ongoing, uh, you know, and, and local manufacturing ongoing in the camps that has been uh, you know, suppressed this year with the destruction of the of, of these camps. Some, uh, you know, with less than a day's notice, with, with bulldozers and otherwise just coming in and, and destroying tea shops, destroying uh, market stalls and things like that. Um, similarly, there's been a crackdown on community-led um, schools, community-run schools, um, which itself is... You know, those opportunities were there. They were created themselves. They were created from the community, within the community, for the community. Yet that's been uh, cracked down upon, and I think that's a that's a real shame. And I think that there's an opportunity to um, for us as uh, you know at the various different levels that we work to have those conversations with camp authorities and and others about. Um, not only the negative impacts of what they're doing, but how this is, you know, increasing their own concerns about the security um, and illegal activity that's within the camps. Um, we'll, we'll say just quick. Interestingly, there is much more support for this type of activity in on Basin Cha and with the refugee community there, rather than Cox's Bazaar. And so, I think um, there's some interesting questions for us there. Um, and the other aspect that I think is closely related to that is the the strength of Rohingya civil society, a, a, a burgeoning nascent civil society that that is, um, you know, that is that has grown in the camps, and obviously there's a lot of pressure around there. There's, um, you know, civil society activists who have been assassinated and killed in the camps. Um, uh, the constant pressure on them. So I think finding ways to support them, give, to provide protection, to be able to amplify and uh, the work that they're doing on their own um, is incredibly important. And so allowing or having the international community support that work and, and continue that work um, would be a, hopefully a good um, stabilizing factor for the, for the area. Um, there's a last question on- Thank you. Yeah, global. but I'll, I'll just jump in as well because um, I do think the question Kirsty asked in relation to Rakhine State and, and the situation in Myanmar comes back to some of the key points that I think uh, all of you made in terms of uh, the, the, the importance of, of really thinking about how to support processes that are being uh, led on different levels by a range of actors. So, um, you know, the elected parliamentarians who formed the CRPH and, and then the National Unity Government have done that in circumstances very few in a political process would have to do in exile, in hiding, in, in online um, to, you know, to create um, the National Unity Consultative Council to engage further with other ethnic resistance organisations to try to see how to um, continue to build on a, a on a roadmap um, and how can um, those movements and actors be better supported in, in what's an increasingly um, dire humanitarian situation but if, if we don't think about some of those um, aspects of transforming the conflict um, you know, we don't want to see the military junta getting any sort of legitimate le legitimacy around the February 2023 elections. And we, we know how that works <laughs> once we, we move that way. And so I think these moments are, um, it seems, uh, really challenging, but there are people doing extraordinary uh, things towards um, trying to address some of those issues. And I know... Um, 
uh, I know that um, uh, DFAT and others have been grappling with some of those intersection, intersecting issues in t terms of, uh, you know, uh, Australian responses. And there's a lot of us that have been trying to do things like we've been holding roundtables at the initiative that are closed, but allow for representatives from the NUG, civil society, humanitarian actors and others from um, parliamentarians in Australia and, and DFAT to try to address, you know, have spaces to deal with some of these aspects and grounding that in in analysis as we were talking about and so I I think that um, they're, they're really um, it's a, I think it comes back to some of these challenges in the work of um, of being able to support what are really rapidly changing uh, uh, aspects of, of of the context in which people are, are working um, and then to our last, um, our last question from Rocco Rob. <laughs> um, if uh, if I'll I'll get Kieran started on that, and then Nathan. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, maybe just to follow up on a couple of things. Um, just back to to Liam's point. Just very again another segue. It's interesting how someone like Liam, and there I could pinpoint three or four Australians that work in prestigious. Uh, and, and really impactful peace building organizations, but not in Australia. Um, that expertise does exist within the Australia diaspora um, and, and to a large degree within Australia. Um, and and I, I feel a lot of the time it's not really tapped as well as it should be. Um, and again, just the, the connections between organizations, we all work together in different places in different, just some of the projects we were talking about earlier on. Um, but just coming back to the question about, about businesses and, and so in, in a lot of ways, commercial exchange, like so if, if you like interactions between people, relationships between people are, are central to, to resolving conflict um, and commercial interactions are part of that. And I think we got it. We do. We do need to to look to the business sector within conflict environments, not to just sort of think of them as drivers of conflict. A lot of my experience is meeting them. They're really anxious to solve these conflicts for their own family reasons, their own community reasons, but also for their own commercial reasoning. Um, I think. But I think then that back to Ziad's point. It's the scale, it's the size, and it's the external interventions, commercial interventions that can cause a lot, a lot of the, it can be, can be a driver of conflict. Um, uh, but of course, obviously, we, what we've witnessed also is business sector willing to, to support and fund that type of work. Um, that question around big issues, you know, civil society engaging on these issues, if I understood what you were, you were, what you were getting at, I think we need to be careful not to perceive civil society as always needing more. Um, I, 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 a lot of the time, I d d describe my knowledge as very limited. I, you know, I've worked for many years in, in, in Papua New Guinea, lived in the Philippines, lived in Fiji, but I'm only scratching the surface of the complexity of these conflict issues. Civil society, individuals, you know, the, the people working on these conflict issues in a, in a context, they're the ones collectively that have that knowledge. Um, what I, I think helps is sort of fresh ideas, fresh methodologies that then they use to their will and the, to fit with the indigenous processes that they support and they and I'll give the example of the type of work we have done, and we, we again supported by Australia, so it's not all. <laughs> is around bringing peace building practitioners from across the Pacific, in particular, because they're, they're they work in a quite isolated way, like they're geographically isolated. It's bringing them together on a specific theme. So one not so long ago was on masculinities. So to sort of learn from each other, um, and that's uh, what we do is simply fa facilitate that space. Um, and that, that can be very impactful. Um, uh, so over to you, I think. Yeah, uh, just quickly on the geopolitical, geopolitics question and the, how that connects with local peace building. I think, um, I mean, particularly in uh, Southeast Asia, South Asia, the way in which we're seeing the geopolitics play out quite often is through uh, large-scale development initiatives. It's around BRI in particular, um, 
and and Western development as well in that space. We not we're not just focusing here on China. Um, and the the role that I think local peace building then plays is understanding how that in development activity um, creates tensions. Working with local peace builders to be able to uh, you know, understand and to to promote the the impacts of that development in their area. I'm thinking specifically of a number of the areas that I've seen good work done in uh, Myanmar and northeastern Myanmar, and understanding how Chinese investment is affecting and um, you know the the conflict environment in that space um and then once you've done that then working with those same groups or various groups in those areas to then work on local solutions to those particular um, negative impacts of the i guess geopolitical geostrategic competition and the larger development initiatives that are ongoing thanks nathan and ziad did you want to add a comment or reflection to that question I just emphasize what Kieran said, right? Where, wherever I've worked and lived in conflict, it, the, you know, compared to the people who have lived through that conflict for generations, we never know anything. We know nothing. So really supporting local organizations, taking them a lot more serious and taking their analysis a lot more serious really has to move to the center of it. So I really just want to double up on that. We've got just a couple more minutes. If, yeah, hi. <laughs> Can you take a picture? Sorry, I was a bit worried whether I won't be able to ask my question. Uh, I'm a Rotary Peace Fellow, uh, doing my Master's in Peace and Conflict Studies at the University of Queensland. Um, Itilina? Itilina, yes. Oh, Hi. I was looking for you. I found you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this is the only peace building session, so it was not difficult to find this session. Uh, I've also worked on women, peace and security issues in Sri Lanka uh, for almost 10 years. Um, my question is to Kiran. Thank you for bringing a gender perspective to this session. Uh, what I'm interested in knowing is my, my question is on a feminist peace um, perspective, uh, whether the women that you work in Bougainville um, are sort of like able to analyze conflict from a anti-military, anti-patriarchal, anti-capitalist uh, point of view. Are you working on that kind of thing? And also to sort of document women's views on these approaches to peace, what you mentioned about ad adaptive peace building, uh, whether there has been any efforts uh, through conciliation resources or any other partners that you work with in Bougainville to send these women's views to evidence-based policy making to DFAT, because that's something that I've worked back in Sri Lanka. I want to know what's happening here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, my name is Lisa Denny. I'm from the Institute for Human Security and Social Change. I had a question about the scale at which you think donors are best placed to deal with conflict. So I feel like some of the different drivers or conflict risks that you spoke about were at quite different scales. So some were at that level of the political settlement, societal wide conflict, and then some seem to be um, perhaps I'm wrong, but more at the sort of community individual level, if we think about issues of exclusion or uh, resource competition between communities, gendered in inequities, that sort of thing. And so should donors work on all of those things? Is, is one a bigger priority? Does one lead to the other? Does addressing one help solve the other? Or do they need to do all of it all at once? Thanks. Thanks, Lisa. Okay, that Got a couple of minutes. Who's going to? Would you like to speak to Talina's? Yeah, I'll take it as a compliment that the white male brought in the gender perspective. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So your 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 question is sort of the the work we do at women in in Bougainville, and the, my PNG program director is here, so she wouldn't even be able to answer it better, or she's going to kill me with my answer. Um, so uh, yes, I mean, look, um, women in Bougainville, as with women in the Banks of Moro, um, as with women in 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 most society, don't necessarily articulate an anti-patriarchal, anti-men. It's the norm. It's the world that 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 they live. It's their lived experience, and and they don't necessarily um, like when we would come along with that perspective, articulate that perspective in working with them. Um, 
it doesn't mean that that patriarchal power dominance does not exist and the um yeah so um i suppose the, the work that we we have done as i say um in it has enabled and i've I'm, I'm trying to think of some basic experiences here ha, has enabled um women leaders to challenge in particular what are locally known as warlords or sort of ex-combatant leaders and and i'll give the perfect example where this in a in a dialogue where you know there was a couple of these warlords um and a a women leader and and just the the forthrightness with which um she was able to challenge the identity structure that they had built around their militia and tear it down and in follow up i could see i could see the subtle thinking that happened within that group that group then did unify with what is the local government they were a separate group in a i they they'd sort of like lock themselves away as a militia it wasn't as a direct result but those are the little incremental changes and those are the little challenges that that women can do within their um societal system in a sense and their power at the power system um and that was that wasn't actually that was a, an event organized by another australian based peace building organization called paxia um so and that that is the type of work that we as outsiders can do is to try and facilitate those spaces that that create a level of comfort for both groups to come in um as regards policy making i i know at one stage we took an opportunity when we were running an event in melbourne to bring up some of these leaders up to canberra to actually meet with um government and that's the type of, it's actually quite difficult to do there's quite a gap in in understanding and communication um uh but in a lot of ways that's the again it's trying to facilitate that type of discussion um sorry that was a bit too long I'm just conscious of the time, but Lisa's question in in relation to scale, we don't quite have the time to to flesh it out. Yeah, but I was thinking how how more regularly I'm hearing multi-scaler for that very reason that often some of this work is being done in one way and connecting to to other sorts of engagements and programs of of work and. Um, and so that's a very unsatisfactory way to end, but what has been a really interesting um, discussion. I'm really grateful to Nathan, Kieran and Ziad and to all of you for your participation and, and questions. So thank you, everyone.